So hello and uh, welcome to you, Balaganapati Devaraconda. Yeah, I hope that's a, an acceptable pronunciation. That's a beautiful Indian name. And uh, thankfully, I am also allowed to call you Bala, uh, which I will do uh, in uh, what follows. And uh, we're talking today about philosophical health uh, because you are a professor of philosophy at the University of Delhi and you have also uh, done a lot to introduce and explore uh, philosophical counseling uh, in India and the idea of philosophical health. So I think we would start with that is like I would ask you your perspective on the matter. Why do you think it's important? Yeah, thank you, Luis, for this uh, uh, wonderful invitation uh, to speak on this platform. Uh, I'm, I really feel honored uh, by this invite. Um, basic point that I have uh, that was that has been troubling me with regard to health is uh, the question that whether health is only a biological kind of one. Okay. And most of the times we also try to understand health in terms of its opposite disease. Okay. Is it that it is only with reference to the disease that we talk about the health or whether health is a natural condition or disease is a natural condition is a long debate that is going on in various cultures. Uh, so let me not enter into that. But along with the biological category, which is called health, we also talk about disorders relating it to the psychological component of the individual, where we talk about various psychological disorders and then try to address them. So is it that individual is composed of only these two, uh, the biological and psychological, or is there anything more than that that uh, tells us that these two are also a part of the larger or uh, the bigger whole uh, called uh, health. So when I was trying to understand that, I was trying to look at uh, World Health Organization's definition of health. I thought that would be helpful, no? Because we, we should look at various definitions that have come. And if it is from World Health Organization, which means most of the countries and most of the people have accepted this definition. Uh, so when I was looking at it, I'll just read it uh, for uh, the sake of all of you. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Okay, so obviously it is taking you know, the definition of health is going beyond the biological or physical and psychological as well. So in such kind of a situation, what is the social well-being or uh, the cultural well-being that? often we do talk about and how do we reach that what should what what are what are the what is the apparatus that we have to address that and i'm i'm quite happy when i uh, first saw um, your website louis and you mentioned that you are advocating philosophical health though before that i was uh, uh, i was into philosophical counseling but uh, first time when I looked at your website and read more details about philosophical health, I was like, yeah, th this is what we are supposed to talk about. Even if we want to advocate philosophical counseling, the first thing is to conceptualize philosophical health, which would be attained through the instrumentality of philosophical counseling. So that, that's, that's what actually uh, triggered my interest in understanding in depth what philosophical counseling could be. So that's, that's how basically when we look at uh, each one of us, like uh, all of us, no? because it's, it's not a disease or a disorder that philosophical uh, health, uh, philosophical counselor tries to address. So that's how we don't call them um, as patients and we call them clients because uh, tomorrow you may come to me and I can also go to you for uh, counseling and seek my philosophical health. Uh, so, in that particular uh, uh, situation, I was trying to understand that it is possible to have cognitive biases and cognitive misapprehensions and wrong conceptions, dilemmas and unreflected presuppositions that all of us carry with us 
and these things do create problems in our social well-being and that's where philosophical health i thought would be very helpful to us and uh, uh, that, that, that that's how i uh, got interested in it uh, and i also look at it from indian i try to look at it from indian perspective i think it's interesting that and we'll talk about the indian perspective uh, very soon because i'm really curious about it uh, but you you have very uh, strategically pointed that at the very heart of the big institution that, that is the World Health uh, Organization, there is this stance that distinguishes health from the absence of disease. And that doesn't not seem to be the everyday biomedical uh, view of it, right? We've seen a lot of that during COVID times, right? So uh, there is a huge um, misunderstanding, I think, uh, or we could say a surrendering, uh, an, a, a sort of, uh, you know, an impression that health professionals sometimes are giving up on the big questions, on the big issues, on, on the, the spiritual and philosophical aspect of the human, because they don't have time for that, they don't get rewarded for that, because it cannot be measured uh, as well as, for example, a different of weight, right? Oh, yeah, you should be uh, yeah. X kilos, you are X minus three kilos, therefore you're not in the norm and statistically you are uh, not uh, healthy, right? So what I'm uh, really curious about, as I said, is so philosophical counseling is, is a practice that is emergent. We can say it's, it's emergent uh, everywhere. It has uh, uh, been identified since the 90s uh, in the Western world, USA, Germany, etc. But still today we could say that uh, people who practice it on a regular basis um, are, are a small community all over the world. And what was very surprising for me is that you uh, are part of the people who, are, who have introduced it in India or we, who are trying to not only observe how it could benefit the Indian society, but also how we can learn from India, how the, say, the Indian philosophical, Indian tradition uh, can give us new ideas uh, to think about philosophical health. Would you like to expand on this? Yeah. Uh... In fact, that WHO, World Health Organization's uh, definition is very interesting and very useful for all of us to uh, ponder upon and then uh, develop our own conception of uh, philosophical health further. I completely agree with you on that. Um, yeah, in fact, I am not the uh, one who has introduced uh, philosophical counseling in India. There are people who are working on philosophical counseling in India since last, say, 20 years, there was, there is an organization which is uh, established, which was established in Jaipur uh, in Rajasthan, India, uh, almost 20 years back, but it is doing its work silently. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I was surprised when I, uh, I, I spoke to the director of the institute and uh, we are also planning to work together. Uh, but fortunately, when I uh, joined Delhi University, I started uh, giving lectures on philosophical counseling and encouraging people to uh, uh, include this in the in their uh, master's uh, uh, program syllabus. No? So that, sorry, what's the name of the institute that you mentioned? Um, the one that is working on philosophical health since you said twenty years. Ah, it's it's Indian Philosophical Counseling. Uh, oh, right. okay, that's okay. Exact name of the institute, I I don't remember. Mm. I, I can't it okay. now. Um, but if you uh, type. Uh, well, We'll put that in the comments uh, later. Ah, so uh, 
yeah but otherwise so so you and... you you yeah so you've you've been involved with some form of uh, education connected to philosophical health right because uh, it's not quite popular in india and i was worried uh, I, I see basically when i was teaching my students here for masters program we get uh, a huge number of uh, students uh, for masters program and not all of them would continue to uh, do research and what would happen to the people who uh, uh, stop their education um, pursuing philosophy after masters so for such kind of students there should be some avenues for jobs etc as well right where they can put philosophy practically into use and it is not that it is not available but we are not teaching them uh, how to put philosophy into practice so mm. that instigated me to uh, include philosophical counseling as one of the papers for masters program and in fact we are successful in starting a center at uh, kerala down south uh, in trivandrum and they have a center for philosophical counseling okay and then uh, in north we have uh, punjab university and then uh, um, calcutta university sorry mumbai university and lucknow university these are various uh, universities public universities in india which have started philosophical counseling as one of the uh, uh, papers uh, in the masters program so that is how we thought we should bring academic acceptance initially so that philosophical counseling as a profession can later on be established as a further step mm. because unless the academia because we 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 get lot of resistance from academia itself or from our own colleagues mm. <laughs> uh, arguing against uh, uh, philosophical counseling uh, right. but luckily uh, so far we are able to overcome such kind of criticism and move forward in making space for philosophical counseling and uh, now we started arguing for philosophical health as well because of uh, um uh, the efforts of many of our friends like louis and mm -hmm. others right and but uh, let's pause I... here a bit because this is very interesting people might ask okay they are doing their thing uh, uh everybody's doing their thing why is that important uh you said two things that are important first of all you said you talked about applying philosophy right that the fact that many philosophical philosophy students do not really know how to apply philosophy in real life because they were not really told about that. And the other thing you said is, okay, so there can be this approach, professionalized approach to philosophical counseling. And people might wonder, but why, why is that important? Well, I think it's important to have a little conversation about that in the sense that, well, first of all, we don't live in a world where thought systems, belief systems, conceptions of life are somewhere uh, stored in books and we don't really look at them or once in a while, but in fact, we go on with our lives without thinking. No, we are in a world which is a constellation of ideologies, right? And every interaction we have whether that's a professional or, or human uh, interaction, is a network of, uh, of embedding, enmeshed, and sometimes contradictory uh, thought systems, right? So there are dominant thought systems today, which are ideologies that precisely tend to minimize the thinking aspect of the human experience, the value aspect of the human experience. And they do that by relying on what Alfred North Whitehead called the, 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 the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Like they tell us what is real, what is hard, has a stone, and what is fluffy and imaginary. So they tell us what is real is numbers, statistics, uh, evidence-based uh, uh, protocols, which of course then they forget very quickly to say that they are themselves uh, embedded in biases and perspectives. And so when we go about in life, we have experiences 
of conflicting thought systems that impact our everyday life. We are constantly uh, being told what how to think well, uh, and and uh, the avenues for cognitive diversity for the fact that we would. Uh, have a world where we respect different forms, not only of life, but of thinking, those avenues are constantly threatened. And, and this is why we think it would be nice uh, to, to take philosophical counseling and philosophical health seriously, uh, such that we institutionalize, and of course, there's a problem always when we institutionalize something, so we'll talk about that, right? But yeah, we, we, we try to institutionalize spaces for resistance against uh, dominant ideologies uh, that people might suffer from in their very life and that, and that might create um, really uh, a lot of drama. We've seen that with, with COVID, uh, where a, a, first of all, there was a, a conflict of views, but also dominant uh, ideology that uh, dictated what people uh, in certain countries at least ought to do and ought to think. So do you, uh, do you resonate with what I'm saying? And, and, and first and foremost, how does that apply to, to the geopolitical, to use a, a big word, uh, space of India, right? Well, why, why is in particular philosophical health and counseling important for within the Indian culture? Yeah, before I get into uh, uh, the Indian culture or uh, talking about India, um, I, I completely agree with uh, what you how you have explained, you know, why uh, philosophical counseling is important. Um, because of the diversity, cognitive uh, diversity that is existent. See, there, there are two things. When I, when I look at it uh, as a philosopher, um, basically we, we have uh, metaphysics and we also have epistemology. And philosophical counseling or philosophical health is rooted in epistemology more than metaphysics. Okay, why do I say that? Because uh, see, for example, the world, the reality that exists around you has diversity, okay? And you cannot uh, change it. And it is a fact of life for all of us. And that's the reality that is existent. But the point is, how do I, as an individual, cognize it, see it, understand it, and then articulate it, and then act in the world? So for me, the way I learn to interact with the world that is given is very important. And that's where there is a primacy of epistemology or metaphysics, which is very important to be stressed. Because even if we are talking about the philosophical health, uh, to ensure philosophical health, where do we intervene in an individual? We have to intervene at the level of epistemology. So the way the individual tries to look at the world and interact the with the world and try to learn uh, about the world. And this is, this is a very important aspect. How do, we, how do I look at this diversity which is existent outside, right? So that is where we have problems in understanding the diversity and in looking at the diversity through my own lens. And my own lens are already created or constructed through my learning over a period of time. You know, the process of uh, uh, acquiring acquisition of knowledge has taught me to look at certain things in certain way. Okay, for example, I, I may give a crude example, but uh, don't mind. Okay, Go ahead. Uh, when one one of the uh, friends from uh, Europe uh, came to India for, for a conference that I have invited. He said, uh, uh, he went to your village by chance. And he said, uh, everywhere there is, uh, there was a cow dung. Okay, uh, shit. So he was disturbed by that. Then I, when he raised it, then I told him that see, cow dung is not seen, uh, seen to be uh, uh, shit by uh, most of the villages in India. Okay, because they use it uh, uh, for uh, antiseptic and they, they use it, they, they smear the house with cow dung. 
okay so it is it is the cultural uh, way of looking at things you no know? people look at things in different ways it is mm. cultural sight you no know? that is very important so that's why i say uh, um, epistemology the way you are taught to look at things and the way you are taught to react after looking at things mm. is very important this training mm. is very important and that's I like your important. sorry to interrupt you here but i like your metaphor it's like uh, uh if someone asks us okay so why do we need philosophical health well because people have different ways of looking at shit <laughs> you can begin with that <laughs> probably yeah <laughs> but please go ahead <laughs> because when you change the diaper of your uh, infant uh, you don't consider it to be uh, really so so and so of the other right <laughs> so your person there's an old, be... an entire phenomenology of excrement that uh, should be written yes <laughs> so uh, that is how uh, the, this uh, epistemology the way we our knowledge system has developed for each one of us i'm not talking knowledge system in general of the countries and societies i'm talking about the individuals because the general one is the one which nurtures the individuals okay and these individuals are more important to us and only addressing the individual uh, health uh, individual philosophical health we can achieve something like uh, uh, happiness that we are talking about universal happiness or whatever that is possible only by Uh, beginning with the individuals so once we understand that it is this knowledge acquisition which has created certain kind of world views because i read somewhere you have written uh, that uh, our thoughts and world views can have generative and performative impact on our lives okay this is what you have written somewhere i was reading one of your articles it is very true because uh, the way you were asked to look at and react to the things is the one which creates your world view and the thoughts thoughts would be based on your world view and obviously that's what would have an impact on what you are talking and what you are doing so in indian tradition we talk about three things uh, manasa vacha karma manas is thoughts okay and walk is words and karma is deed the the work that you do okay they say honesty doesn't mean uh, anything else but honesty to yourself means uh, there should be uniformity in what you think what you speak and what you act and if these three things are aligned then that's what is honesty individual honesty according to indian tradition so uh, why i am stating this is that is how the metaphysics epistemology and logic which helps us to articulate things in a better way and ethics which helps us to act in a certain way or good way in the society all four of them are situated within us and in fact the alignment of all these four in a proper way is what is called philosophical health so instead of talking about ethics as some uh, moral principles which exist somewhere or logic is some uh, advanced logic which doesn't uh, which exists only in machines or not in human beings if we can talk about philosophical health we can explain what is philosophy in a better way to younger generations so that is how we can make younger generations understand philosophy and philosophical health in a better way by approaching it through how knowledge is acquired how world views are formed and these world views in turn reflect in our words and on our actions is the best possible way of uh, reaching out to them uh, so th- this is how i uh, uh, look at these things that that's how we uh, tend to have epistemological biases that you also often refer to and also metaphysical misconceptions and these metaphysical misconceptions conceptions though they get created by epistemological biases it is also two way process in the sense that each one of them try to correct each other correct the other and that is possible and the possibility of that ensures philosophical health possibility so possibility of philosophical health according to uh, my understanding so uh, basically this is how i look at the things no but this is um, I I think it's important sense. because i mean even though some people who listen might find um, words like epistemology uh, difficult uh, i think it's important that 
uh, and that's something I'm endeavoring to to do also is that there, there must be more theorization uh, about uh, philosophical health and philosophical counseling. Uh, it's not just about deep listening, also, although deep listening is very important. Um, there's so much in, in what you were saying, but I would like to add two things that are really going in, in your direction is that you have shown one way in which the idea of philosophical health can be understood by all. Indeed, that integrity, uh, which you define as honesty, that sort of structural integrity uh, that combines uh, a, a acts and thoughts um, and words in, in a way that is harmonious. That is something that people can uh, relate to. And if epistemology might seem a difficult world for some, well, think about the fact that it is the, the, um, the way we understand our knowledge of the world and that knowledge itself is not necessarily something that comes with a, a, a complex scientific apparatus, of course. Uh, knowledge is also always embedded and enmeshed with experience, right? It's not like we, as it, and this is just another way of formulating what you were saying. It's not like we go in the world, we have experiences, and then we sit in a sofa and we try to process them uh, by reading a book and sort of see, okay, how, how does this can be, how can this become knowledge? That's one aspect, of course, when we want to theorize. But in, in fact, in, in our very experience of the world, as you were saying, there is a, a, a projection of notions uh, that are um, cognitive. And so I find this very important for the precisely for the matter of uh, cognitive diversity, right? Because we'll be able to to have a world, which I agree with you, it's 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 the deepest diversity, the diversity of worldviews and how they can cohabit. And um, my curiosity is, is there a word, because you said that's the, the Indian tradition and, and there is this idea of honesty. I sometimes use, use the term of uh, structural integrity because um, at, at one point I realized uh, I, I was working with a lot of engineers. You know, I, I'm working with the uh, multinational Vattenfall and they're engineers and they're really interested in philosophical health. And I realized, well, structural integrity, that's a good metaphor that they understand because this is also something that a bridge might have, right? That means that it is robust enough that it won't break. And that includes some form of plasticity too, because some, when something is too rigid, it breaks. That's the, also the La Fontaine uh, fable about uh, the oak uh, and the smallest tree who, 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 who perhaps when there's a tempest is more um, uh, resilient. There's another term that I sometimes uh, refer to, and more so now, is uh, the conceptual constellation. So I think it's important for people to perhaps grasp the fact that philosophical health is not necessarily about having this monomaniac ideal, let's say, let's say it's honesty, right? And I say, oh, I'm going to be honest uh, in everything and, and can go the way, all the way in or justice, right? And because life is not like that. Life needs some form of negotiation, flexibility, etc. What I do think is that we can make ourselves more lucid about our conceptual constellation. That's what we are trying to help people with, such that they understand what, are, what is the network of notions that are uh, important for that person's destiny and biography. And then this network or constellation of, of notions form the concept of who you are, 
right? And they themselves are a, a dynamic construct. They are they are not completely rigid, such that you would be once and for all crystallized into this constellation. Uh, perhaps some, let's say, one node of this constellation or one star, if we want to keep the metaphor, is is honesty. Well, uh, this needs to be articulated with perhaps another no, which would be truth, et cetera. So it's, it's a complex process of elucidation, uh, but which helps the person have a better robustness uh, uh, in, in front of the constant, as we were saying before, um, imperatives of alien ideologies this alien ideology sounds a bit like conspiracy consp conspiration theory right no it's just that you know every every time you do something you have different systems of codes right web webs of beliefs and sometimes you accept them right there for example when you drive right it it's a code and you you don't challenge that because you know you think well it's probably going to be better for me if i if I abide by the rules of driving of, of the place in which I But there are other rules and codes that are much more, uh, you know, uh, impacting our, our psyche. And that is how, and I will, I will finish here and, and give you the ball, but that is how I think philosophical health is articulated with psychological health and physical health. There are correspondences. Uh, and uh, a bad philosophical health can lead to a bad physical health. And that's, that's a trope of Greek thought, right? That's what the Greeks said with men sana in corpore sanus. So although now I'm speaking Latin, but uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the healthy body in the healthy mind. Yeah, I uh, completely agree with you on this uh, first thing that you spoke, like structural integrity that you said you would be talking to uh, your clients. Uh, in fact, the structural integrity is not just there in the external uh, world. No, uh, the structural integrity within the individual is what Indian tradition tries to address. That is where I was saying, like uh, thought, word, and action. One of the major problems, uh, Luis, that I find is uh, when we talk about these virtues and values, most of the times we don't explain what this virtue is. Even if you have to explain what this virtue, for example, honesty is, you would be telling them that you should not, uh, you should do this, this, this. So a kind of descriptive uh, presentation happens. Instead, if you can help under uh, somebody understand by uh, integrity or honesty, it is something that whatever you think and whatever you say and whatever you do have to correspond and stay in harmony, then it is better understood by the individual instead of just merely saying that be honest. So if you go on saying be honest, the person may have, after some time like these, these terms are taken at their face value and left at the face value and they will not be taken in and actually it doesn't uh, come out in the uh, sphere of uh, uh, impacting the behavior. So that is, that is the major problem that I find uh, when, when we talk about most of these values uh, uh, that uh, uh, we teach our younger generations. And uh, in this uh, particular uh, way, you know, in this particular context, it will not be uh, odd to talk about this. Uh, people, we, we do clutter. You know? decluttering of uh, uh, human beings is required. You know? Each one of us, uh, philosophical health also has to address this decluttering of mind and decluttering or physically also we get cluttered. And this, this is very important. And when I was talking somewhere about this, people asked me, what are the ways of decluttering the mind? So can you explain? So I said, see, decluttering the mind doesn't mean you have to do some exercises or yoga or something. In the social sphere, 
you 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 have uh, uh, you you nurture the emotional values that you have to that you must have towards the other like piety and being grateful to life is one of the ways of uh, decluttering your mind and being having uh, forgiving the other is one of the ways of decluttering the mind and in buddhism uh, louis we find uh, a uh, very interesting concept called the brahma viharas okay which are uh, 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 which are stated to be four in number that talk about maitri friendship okay through friendship i i consider these four uh, to be brahma viharas that they the word that they use they are very useful for decluttering because once you once you develop a kind of uh, Uh, a friendly uh, attitude towards the other the other could be an animal or a human being or anybody then uh, the decluttering process of decluttering in your mind automatically starts happening mm. and in this context they talk about something called mudita and mudita is understood to be you no know, it is explained this way mudita is an explained as uh, rejoicing the happiness of others see when louis is happy and if i can also feel happy that he is happy that that, that it goes to such finer states you no know, this is what is decluttering and it is not that it is not natural to human beings it is natural to human beings but somehow we have suppressed them uh, and the greediness or whatever <laughs> have <laughs> taken the predominance and started cluttering our mind so nurturing these emotional values and virtues itself helps in our uh, uh, um, in developing our uh, philosophical health uh, for example any of these uh, concepts maitri karuna karuna is uh, benevolence no? um, um, uh, and then mudita and then upeksha no equanimity so these are the four concepts that mm. buddhism uh, uh, tries to help us in understanding and they are they are very helpful in uh, de- de- developing philosophical health nurturing philosophical health mm. no that's very interesting and i would uh, i would encourage you once once i post this uh, video on uh, youtube maybe you can uh, uh, go in the comment and just write down these concepts for for people who listen to us uh, such that I- they can do more research Uh, I like your idea of um, a, a a certain um, relationship to the other, but also this sort of um, healthy minimalism, where uh, indeed we don't load our our mind with um, unnecessary baggage. What you said about joy remind me of a. Um, a counselee i tend to call them counselees rather than than clients because i don't do this for a living and and sometimes i think client sounds a little bit like um this is a a, a full time um profession but more interestingly so her she came to me and she said my problem is that i'm too joyful <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful right i'm too joyful and the problem is is that others the others are not as joyful as me and 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 so i don't know how to negotiate that because it might be a, a partner might be a colleagues at work may she might she might have felt that well the world around her is constantly putting her down a little bit putting some weight on her tro- shoulders right and uh in in that case we talked about uh one of the uh, things we talked about is uh, spinoza right because uh, so this is to give a a concrete example of how a philosophical consultation might go so philo- spinoza baruch de spinoza who was um the uh the philosopher uh that considered that joy was really the basic core emotion and that all, all other emotions was variations uh of joy and joy is the feeling that our domain of possibility is 
increasing, right? That we can have a coherent action upon the world. And sadness is the emotion that goes along with the fact that our domain of possibilities is shrinking. And then you can do different variations um, with other types um, of emotions, right? Uh, and, and just to finish, joy connects also with what Nietzsche called the great health, right? Uh, or, or the joyful uh, science, right? And, and so philosophical health is not only, for those who, who might think so, is not only, oh, we're going to teach you about how to think logically. It's also about, as you were saying, gratitude, uh, what I call the connection with the Creel. I, I want to talk about that with you, right? Because yeah. I think this has very be stronger uh, resonances with uh, what we call Eastern philosophies, right? So resonance with the fact that the universe is a, is a co-creative flux uh, of interdependent uh, possibilities, uh, that I called Creel simply because it's the real with, it's the creative real, right? Um, as opposed with this idea that we sometimes have in neoliberalism or, or, or uh, the Anthropocene, right? The industrial uh, age that the world is basically a stone, quite hostile. And we need to produce a lot and build a lot of things such that we have an okay life. And in fact, we've seen now it destroys everything. Um, so that gratefulness is not just intellectual. It's uh, okay. So hmm, if, if at the ontological origins of things, that's not a, we, we spoke about epistemology. Now we can spoke, speak about ontology. If, if at the, the core of being, there is this co-creative becoming. Therefore, I can be grateful by default, not to accept the world in a sort of a, a badly understood stoicism, right? And adapt and take and, and accept whatever political abuse there is around me, no. But first feel that, that creel source and then through a process, that I call creolectics, but through a process of actualization, which can be political, ethical, existential, then we, we are much more joyfully empowered to act upon the world and make things right according to, to our worldview, or at least try to negotiate. Yeah, that's great. Uh, uh, actually, before I uh, respond to what you said uh, just now, uh, let me just clarify one thing. When I was referring to this Buddhist concept, uh, concept of Brahma Viharas, uh, previously when I was talking, it is also called understood or translated into English as uh, something four immeasurables. Okay, these three, these four that I was referring to, one is uh, Mitrata or Metta in Pali, which is uh, uh, loving kindness, okay, or benevolence. The first one is mit Maitri or Metta in Pali, which is translated into English as uh, uh, loving kindness for the other. And the second one is uh, Karuna. Karuna is compassion, compassion for the other. And the third one, this is what is very important to me, uh, which is, uh, uh, which goes as Mudita, which means, which is often translated as joyfulness, but actually it's not joyfulness, rejoicing the happiness of others. Mm. Okay, that's what is mudita, okay? And the fourth one is upeksha, which is equanimity. And these four are understood to be immeasurables. Okay, <laughs> you, you cannot even measure the kind of uh, uh, impact that, would, uh, that you would have when you practice these uh, in your own self. That is all uh, they are explained. So I thought that I should explain them in a proper way. This is very important. And before you continue, because I want to let you continue, yeah. uh, you said that equanimity is the what's the term for equanimity? Uh, upeksha. Upeksha. We need uh, to have a conversation about that. Um, uh, not not today, because this is. In, I think it it take it will take some time because I was actually yesterday uh, thinking about equanimity 
uh, which is which is uh, the Latin word. I mean, it's it's English, but it's based on Latin. Equal equality of soul. Let's say it's that you might have ups and downs around you, and uh, but you sort of maintain that equality of soul. Uh, whatever happens around you, uh, the Greeks called it. Ataraxia, right? Ataraxi is sometimes used. Yeah. And I think this is wonderful because indeed it is a um, it is a forgotten virtue uh, that is that would be um, very um, useful today. And that is, I agree. I think the, that the four elements you're giving are very important for philosophical health. But please continue. Yeah, the second one that you are talking about uh, uh, is. Uh, Creatics. When you are talking about co-creativity, so what is it that this co-creativity tries to hint to us is that it tries to minimize minimize the human agency. Okay. Often we we think that we are the doers and we are the ones who are changing the world and doing a lot of things. But once you understand the importance of co-creativity, which means the participation of the other other than you who is existent around you in this process of co-creativity, you understand that you are one among many other things that exist around you in co-creating your own conception and also contributing the, to the conception of the other. So this, this homogeneous understanding or holistic understanding of the, uh, developing this kind of worldview you know, where you also often talk about multiverse. So talking about this uh, uh, holistic conception uh, is the one which really helps us in maintaining philosophical health. Because most of the problems that we come across are because we think that we are the only ones who are doing it. And it is only because of me that this is happening. So this, this kind of egoistic attitude that we often develop uh, would be minimized if we follow, uh, uh, if we have a proper understanding of uh, the creolectics that you're talking about, uh, that's my uh, submission to you. The other one, you rightly pointed out uh, equanimity towards the end. Uh, you are also talking about the uh, concept of joy as it is presented by many of these Western philosophers. Uh, in fact, if you look at Indian tradition, what it says is, uh, this equanimity, it stresses the equanimity because as an individual, how should you look at both joy and sorrow? Okay, it says it is not that you have to go on increasing your happiness. If you start go on trying to work out on your happiness alone and try to go further, whenever you get sadness, you it, it affects your uh, uh, philosophical health negatively. So it is not that you have to continuously work on increasing your happiness. It is that wherever you stand, you have to learn and practice by controlling your mind, how to look at both of them, because after the one, the other would follow. So it is not that anybody, whether you are rich or poor, it doesn't matter. Anybody would be uh, oscillating between uh, happiness and uh, sorrow continuously in the life. So if that is the fact of life, how do you look at both of them? And how do you develop your own perception, cognitive structures in such a way that you would be able to balance both of them in a proper way in leading a life of philosophical health? So this is what uh, uh, even uh, the, the word that uh, Buddhism uses is Upeksha and uh, the word that Hinduism or Bhagavad Gita the sacred text of uh, Hindu tradition uses the word samatha. Samatha is equanimity. And this is very important. This equanimity in uh, Bhagavad Gita uh, is in fact, it is explained in terms of uh, how should, uh, how do I live? You know, because when, when each one of us, all of us are living uh, our lives and uh, in the process of living our lives, we have to encounter three things we have to manage or live with three things. One is the objects, objects that we have uh, in the world. The second one is beings, other human beings and other beings that we have in the world. 
and the third one is most important our own experiences we have to live with these three objects beings and the, our own experiences so how do you live with these three bhagavad gita uh, stresses that it is by developing an attitude of equanimity that you can possess or continue to nurture your philosophical health and that possessing that philosophical health is called yoga so that is how it is called mm. samarpam yoga mutyate yoga is equanimity possessing equanimity mm. in the mind mm. according to bhagavad gita i am only talking about bhagavad gita right, right, right. so that's so this, this is an interesting area in fact we can have uh, no I, I, and, and we will certainly uh, that's also very interesting because it 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 leads us to mention how sometimes uh occidental re uh cycling of eastern cultures uh is let's say uh sometimes deficient right the anecdote here is that i personally have tried once or twice to go to your yoga class and we see it in the first thing that i often hear from the instructor okay so don't think and this is where i stand and i leave the room <laughs> because for me uh, there's nothing wrong with thinking the art of breathing is as uh, important as the art of thinking and this is part of who we are and this is uh, uh, why i like the fact that you 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 talked about manas before right so not forgetting that this experience is also as you said very well the way we look at experience right so it's not just behaviorism uh it's also how do i process that information to use a very uh bad um computer me metaphor right and so i'd like to finish because i mean we will have more conversations uh Uh, just to keep it to this sort of uh, arbitrary format of, of less under one hour. Concretely, uh, why do you think um, India? I mean, what what's what do you think is the the contribution? Not only why is philosophical constant good for India, but also uh, what what can be the contribution? Like. Uh, Do you think there will be an Indian school of philosophical counseling? Or, on the contrary, do you think that philosophical health reveals also a, a universal uh, experience of what it is to be human, fully human, uh, and therefore we should learn from different cultures, but also realize that uh, we're talking more or less we, we were talking more or less about the same thing without uh trying to be normative right here we are back to the cognitive diversity it's not about a universal recipe it's just about potentials right um uh, for for expansion of the domain of possibility in harmony with others yeah. that was actually a question <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah obviously we are not trying to say that one culture uh, inputs from one culture uh, would be uh, we are not putting any hierarchy among the cultures and any normativity that we are looking at but otherwise also i would say many cultures for instance including indian culture has this universal human being conception of universal human being and conception of universal health as well and this is to be tapped you know we we have to go to various cultures and uh, have a look at them and similarly when we look at indian conception india indian tradition classical indian tradition we would definitely find uh, hints to um, universal uh, health so that that is very important and that's where most of the indian philosophical schools uh, as we began with the cognitive biases right and most of the indian philosophical schools directly or indirectly try to address this particular issue okay 
it is not that indian tradition as sometimes projected advocates only absolutist perspective no for instance if you look at uh, uh, buddhism buddhism talks about uh, many of the more indian philosophical schools talk about going beyond binaries or looking at within binaries okay which means the cognitive bias is because there are bi binaries okay either this way or that way and buddhism talks about madhya marga which is mid middle path okay so it says don't don't go with uh, the extremes stay in the middle because that's what probably would give you a right path and similarly jainism you know, which is quite popular among people uh, it talks about uh, uh, the multi uh, layeredness of the reality and the way the need for anekantavada it's called anekantavada anekanta is the reality has many sidedness and that is how you will never be able to comprehend uh, comprehensively have a understanding of the reality and whatever statement that you make about reality that is given to you is only partial so it it always says your statements are only partial please do remember that no it it tells you that uh, it's it's not the binary it is in fact uh, uh, much more than that and there is another interesting school by name advaita vedanta which is often sometimes misunderstood uh, which talks about which says that reality is beyond these binaries see these two try to say within binaries and uh, advaita vedanta says you you cannot even define it as this or that you know uh, because sometimes it looks to be this and sometimes it looks to be unreal so that is how you cannot give an absolute assertive statement about what is given to you so what i am trying to stress here is with regard to the cognitive uh, structures that we talk about the indian conceptions are varied in fact when we talk about philosophical health we can use any of these apparatus that are presented that are already available in the indian philosophical resources and help the client in understanding his own self or his own cognitive biases in a better way and that is how i feel indian tradition has rich resources which can be used by anybody and just one point before we, uh, i stop uh, with regard to yoga that you have mentioned <laughs> i understand uh, your concern uh, basically uh, yoga now has become a global commodity and many people have taken it and uh, they have uh, made it as a commodity to suit certain kinds of uh, uh, needs of the people okay in the process i don't uh, with, with all due respect to all the teachers of yoga i am not making any derogatory comments here but in the process probably the actual uh, uh, whatever no purport of uh, yoga might be sometimes missing because when you pick up a particular part from the conception of holistic yoga and present it to somebody else obviously it will have uh only partial impact or effect so that is how whenever we talk about yoga we we need to have a, a, a clarity with regard to whether we are talking about patanjali yoga or the yoga of bhagavad gita and also further whether we are within patanjali yoga whether we are only uh, piecing out something and presenting it to the people okay which may not be really helpful to all so that that's that's what we we have to be very careful yeah so no i i i suggest that we may conclude on that uh if we can play a little bit with words but the reason why some people are afraid of philosophy is that in order to overcome a world of commodities you need perhaps as a first stage to accept to be uncomfortable and comod <laughs> uh, and then of course once you have accepted to challenge your routine certainties and and perhaps illusions of security and illusions of injustice based on on the wrong views then you can start to uh, recreate and indeed not in a way where 
we would have the human at the center in this anthropo anthropocentric view um, of uh, you know um, the protagoran view that the man humans are the measure of all things but rather and this is all the more needed today uh, in a in a dialogue with all forms of life all form of being and what they might have in common so but i suggest we we stop here uh, for the moment. Uh, and uh, this is just, a, of course, the, the beginning of a conversation, a dialogue. Uh, and we will certainly, and this is something that uh, I want to leave uh, as a little bit of a mystery for the people who are listening to us. But I, from our conversation, I, got the feeling that we need to write something together about something <laughs> but but let's keep that as a yeah as a teaser yeah thanks a lot yeah thank you so much uh, Luis. i really enjoyed this conversation and i hope uh, people would also uh, like it and watch it <laughs> and we'll continue the conversation thank you